be changed. Preach and Papa, come and preach to us. sausage made. Amen. All right. I want to. I want to mention something before I get into the Word today. Um, we got two or three things we need to really keep in prayer. I understand Brother Greg still having some trouble with his sickness. Uh, a lot of problems. Giving him antibiotics and creating some problems with the antibiotics. So uh, keep him in our prayers. Also, Sister Francis. That's having chemo. Uh, their blood levels are really staying good. Actually, surprising the doctors how well it's doing. So let's keep her lifted up in prayer. She's believing God for a total miracle there. And uh, Sister Nelson uh, also was in an auto accident. And uh, she's got some situations there. So let's keep her in prayer. And uh, so we got those three things that's uh, kind of special that we need to pray about and lift up before the Lord and uh, believe God. So hopefully you won't just like today, but you will pray for them in your daily prayer times and call the Lord daily for them that they would uh, be able to be delivered from this situation. And uh, I want to read today. Uh, I feel what I have today is kind of directional for the church. Uh, and I feel like the timing's right for this message for the church today. And uh, I preached along these lines before, years ago, when I first came here. But I feel like we've come a, a circle to a place that we're ready to hear something. This is where we're really at right now. Uh, if you got your Bibles in the book of Haggai, chapter 2. And uh, somebody's not a happy camper back there. Haggai chapter 2 and verse 15. We'll start reading there. I tell you, well, let's back it up to verse 14. Yeah, no. Well, you know, let's just start with 15 because you wouldn't understand 14 because you don't have the verses before it. So let's just leave that one alone. Start with verse 15. And now I pray you consider from this day and upward that before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord. Now this is talking about actually there's two things going on here. This is talking about an old temple and a new temple. But uh, basically it's really uh, not spiritually dealing with a, new, with a physical temple. When you talk about typology, Haggai, how many know the Bible said the Old Testament is a type and a shadow of the New? So everything that went on in the Old Testament was typing out what was going to happen in the New Testament church. You can say praise the Lord. But this is one of the heaviest ones as far as imagery. Because he actually is talking about a, uh, working on a physical temple, but he's actually not talking about working on a physical temple, it becomes evident. Because when the language changes here a little bit later, it definitely language of the new covenant as quoted in the book of Hebrews and other places. Because he talks about he's going to shake all nations and all these type things. We know that when he shook all nations was when he destroyed Jerusalem and he uh, instituted the new covenant into being. And that was the covenant or the new temple of God, which is the church or the kingdom. So he's actually dealing in typology. You know, God will say something literally, but he's actually trying to imply something spiritually. And I believe that's exactly what he's doing here. So I want you to understand that. He said, since those days were, when one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. 
You know, he was coming looking for 20, there was just 10. He's implying that Israel was in famine. Okay, they're in a famine. He said, when one came to the press fat to draw out 50 vessels out of the press, there were but 20. Come needing, our needs were, we need 50. But when I got here to get it, there was only 20. So this is definitely a famine. But to why is Israel in famine? Why are they, you know, not able to have the full thing? Well, the devil is fighting the church. The devil is fighting. No, listen, better read the next verse. God is speaking. He said, I, the Lord, smote you with blasting and mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands. Yet you turn not to me, saith the Lord. God said, I called this. I did not bless what you did. I sent judgment against what you were doing. And yet you still didn't hear what I really wanted. You were missing the purpose of what I was trying to desire. You still did not turn and do what I wanted done. So you are still in famine. What's the problem? He said, consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. He's talking about even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was made. Now we understand there was a literal, one temple literal, destruction of that, and the rebuilding of that temple, then the destruction of it in 70 AD, and the bringing in the new covenant, which was a spirit, totally a spiritual temple. He said, consider it. And here's his question. You know, I'm going to get some, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to get vessels. I'm going to get draw things that's been the work of my hand, but it's, it's, it's not enough. It's not there. He said, is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth. From this day will I bless you. There's something going on or can happen that from that day forward, God would begin to bless. He would end the famine. He would end the, the blessing. God would begin to work with the people. And of course, when you go back into this chapter, you begin to understand that. And uh, I want to, I've talked on this very subject before, and I'm gonna, I think it's a good title, so I'm just going to use the same title again. And I believe that where we are today as a church, and that is, it's time to plant the seed and end the famine. It's time to plant the seed and end the famine. You see, Israel was in famine because the seed was in the barn. Now, why was the seed in the barn? How many knows in the New Testament, the seed is what? The Word of God, isn't it? It's the New Testament gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are called to be witnesses of Him. Praise God. All right, thank you, sister. Appreciate the, let's give her a hand today. Amen. Appreciate her playing for us here. Praise God. And I want to say that I really enjoyed getting to teach Wednesday night to some people that uh, I was called specifically to teach on uh, the prophecy and uh, my beliefs in eschatology to a church that probably, uh, well, most of that church, probably 100% of them had never even heard that except the pastor. He had got hold of my materials and uh, wanted me to come teach it to his church because he wanted to rid them of the fear factor. And... Uh, so we were, had a great time teaching there. It was probably about, uh, I'd say at least 50 people that had never heard it before. And they were quite astounded by all the, that we uh, taught. And he wanted me to come back and teach it, break it down, teach it, you know, slowly to the people, each subject matter at a time, so they could fully grasp and understand it. 
So I'm looking forward to that. Also, we're going to get to preach for Brother Thompson in Florida. I just booked my tickets going to Florida to preach for him. Uh, first part of December, so I'm looking forward to that. So I'm thankful the Lord is uh, is on the throne and doing some things. Amen. And there's people hungry out there for the things of God. And uh, people are working for the things of God. But here we find Israel, and I believe Israel's a type of the church. And uh, I believe a lot of what we've done in the last uh, several years here, uh, God has led us a long way since the day I accepted pastor to this church years ago. And uh, we've come a long, long way. We've had a lot of changes, and a lot of things happen. God has given us a lot of revelation. And I believe uh, a lot of what we did and we're doing dealt with our efforts to uh, locate the church. Who are we? What is our, our real, what are we doing? You know, what, instead of really dealing with the purpose of the church. And, uh, and we've been trying to locate, and we found out a lot. We found out, you know, we, we learned about going on to perfection or full growth, 100% maturity. We learned about the kingdom life. We learned uh, God has brought us out of legalism, making our outward our holiness to the inward being our holiness and he's uh he's done a lot of things for us and led us in a lot of different directions learning that we are the true israel of god we are god's people there's uh learning that we're in the kingdom now and learning that we are in the kingdom now is such an important thing because we don't look to some people get distracted by false eschatology in the fact that they're looking for some end time bad scenario you see what i'm saying and they're in preparation for that rather than doing the will of God and doing what we're supposed to be doing for the kingdom of God right now. And that's work and build his kingdom. And uh, so I think that uh, we uh, sometimes get, uh, we can get sidetracked from the purpose. You understand what I'm saying? All that needs to be done. All that needs, we need to know. We need to understand about spiritual maturity. And uh, because if we're not spiritually mature, God can't bring a bunch of young babies into something that's not totally mature because uh, carnality and that stuff would actually kill a lot of those people. Amen. We've got to be ready and uh, we've got to understand these things. So all of it's been good. and uh, But we really uh, are not understanding, I think, what is the true purpose of God. And there's nothing wrong with all the things we do. You know, we sometimes give to missions and think, well, we've accomplished the will of God. We've reached another nation. But have we really reached another nation? And we do certain things. To, we're willing to sometimes give our money and we'll give a lot of things. But, uh, you know, sometimes what the real purpose of God is is going to require us to give a lot of our time. And sometimes we don't have a lot of that to give to God. But the true purpose of the church, Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. You know, I've come to, I've come to reach the lost people. And we can sit here as a church and talk about, you know, what all God's done for me. And, uh, but what about the ones that have never heard the message? What about the ones, what about our neighbors that don't know anything about the message of God? The ones that think everything's all right, but it's really not all right, maybe. And, uh, or maybe they, it's not all right, and I know it's not all right, but they don't really have a desire to do anything about it. You know, nobody's really touched them. Nobody's really, you know, somebody, I guarantee you, if you're in this church today, somebody brought you the message of God. Now, I don't know if any of you had an angel come down out of heaven while you was in prayer. And explain to you the plan of salvation. I never had that happen to me. I had to dig. I had to study on my own. I had to get it on my own. Somebody had to come to me. How can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach except they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. And bring glad tidings of good things. And Paul quoted that in the book of Romans. And said that scripture referred to the apostles. So it's referred to the New Testament preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we got to understand, what are we doing here? Are we here just to be blessed? No, we can be blessed, but we're here to bless somebody else. We're here to be a blessing. We're here not just to become selfish people that sit on a pew and know what we know and enjoy what we enjoy. We are come, you know, what we have leads people to eternal life. 
What we have changes people's lives. What we have will change the focus of their lives. What we have will mature people to maturity in Jesus Christ and totally make a difference in their life. Amen. So what we, the real purpose of what we're doing is uh, we've really called to seek and to save that which is lost. You know, he said, you're going to be witnesses unto me. When the Holy Ghost comes upon then you're going to be witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. One of the reasons of the Holy Ghost, part of the uh, purpose of the Holy Ghost. Of course, it's designed to lead and to guide us into all truth. But you know, are we going to selfishly sit on truth? It's like sitting, if you could go to a foreign nation today, and you could sit there, say Africa or some part of Africa, that some parts of Africa are really struggling, other parts are not really struggling. But if you could go to a part that's really struggling, where even some of the uh, countries down south of here, the island countries, that hurricanes have wiped them out. They don't even have decent water to drink, decent clothes to wear. Could you go sit in a glass house and sit there and eat your ham and eat your turkey and eat your drink your water while you watch these thousands out there in ragged clothes that don't even have decent water to drink. Come on. Come on. And say, I'm seeing how I'm blessed to the Lord. I'm blessed to the Lord. But I'm not willing to step out here and give what I have and share it with somebody that has nothing. You say, Brother Smith, you know, I, I, I'd never do that. Yeah, we can understand these things in a physical sense. And that's why God has many times typed out just like he has right here in a physical sense. Because we sometimes can't relate to it when it's dealing in the spiritual. We can only relate to it in the physical. That's why he dealt with sheep and goats and cows and money and talents and things that we could understand. And we could hope to take something in the natural and relate to it in the spiritual. Because we sometimes don't have the ability as human beings to grasp something in the spiritual that God's trying to say. So he has to bring it down on a level that we can relate to. So I bring that little story on a level that you could relate to. But it's the same thing we can do today as we sit here in the house of God in our little glass kingdom and we have the blessings of God. We have the power of God. We have the anointing of God. We have the truth of God. We have the healing power of God. Yet there's many out there that's walking around us have nothing but we're not willing and willing to share it with them. This is exactly what God was dealing with. Let's go back to chapter 1. Let's catch up what's really going on here. In chapter 1, verse 2, now he first talks about a time, the second year of Darius, who he's speaking to, and he's dealing with Zerubbabel and uh, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, to Joshua, the son of Joshadek, the high priest. So all that's typology too, because he goes on to the end of the chapter and says they're going to become a signet, which means a sealer. It means they're going to become preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How I many knows a seal is a, is a sealer of the covenant? It's what it's dealing with. We are sealers of the covenant. We have the ability to go out and to seal uh, up on somebody else's life. We have the ability to baptize them in the name of Jesus. We have the ability to lay hands on people and they get the Holy Ghost. We have the ability to talk to people and bring them into a mindset of the kingdom of God that will change their life. God has set us up as sealers of the covenant we have been given something very powerful very anointed life saving life changing very great matter of fact it's the total purpose of Jesus Christ coming to die it's the total purpose of this earth it's the total purpose of humanity it's the total purpose of God for the earth because he said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? What is he going to give in exchange for that soul? We don't impress God with our millions. We don't impress God with our good looks. I'm certainly glad we don't have to or I'd be in trouble. I told somebody the only time I get depressed is every morning when I look in the mirror. But, but uh, 
you know, God's not, we don't, we don't shake God with that. Uh, but he says here, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, the people say, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. God is trying to get Israel to build a house. He's trying to get Israel to go to work on his house. Now what is his house today? It's the kingdom of God. He's trying to get his people, his covenant people, to go to work on his house. And they're saying, the time is not yet. The time is not right, God. It's not time for revival. It's not time to reach soul. It's not time to work on this house. It's not time to do anything. It's not time to plant the seed so there can be oil. There's not time to go out and work for the kingdom. <coughs> People's arguing with God. So God had them in a famine. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, verse 4, <coughs> listen carefully. <clears throat> you say it's not time but look God said is it time for you O ye to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste that sealed house means closed up house your own little world is it time for you to dwell in your own little world do your own little thing in life while my house and my purpose and my covenant and my purpose in the earth is lying waste over here? Do your own little thing in life while my house is wasting over here? Is it time for that? Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts consider your ways. Consider For well, you've sown much, but you bring in little. You eat, but it's not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You're not satisfied. You clothe you, but there is none more. What is this? You're definitely in a famine. You're definitely not getting the full benefits of what's for you. You're definitely living in a, in a dimension that's less than what God wants to give. You're being satisfied with a whole lot less than what God wants to do. You're just living in your sealed houses and just willing to be satisfied with what's there instead of pressing to get the total package. He that earneth his wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes in it. You just, when you go out and make all this money, you're just putting it into a bag that's got holes in it. Don't, how many knows that money just seems to not go anywhere anymore? Somebody may have saw on Facebook my nephew, uh, nephew's boy. Uh, I'm called my nephew Sambo. Uh, it was funny. Let me tell you a story that happened if I can do that without losing thought. Uh, my nephew uh, owns a liquor store in uh, Hampton, Arkansas. He never goes there. They just send him a check every week for $1,000 for the liquor store, and he never goes there, never sees it, don't even know what goes on. He, the guy keeps the rest of the money. But anyway, he, it's called Sambo's Liquor Store. Well, this couple that came here, remember Paul and Lisa Summers? I met them in El Dorado, Arkansas, and had breakfast with them. We talked for two or three hours while they were on their way to El Campo. And she said, you know, I knew I was in the South because last night I stopped, had him stop the car. I saw this sign that said Sambo's Liquor. I said, you know what? I know Sambo. He said, what? I said, I know Sambo. Said, How do you know him? He's my nephew. I thought that was the funniest thing. She thought when she saw Sambo's Liquor Store, that was, I was, she stopped and took a picture of the sign. I had to tell Sambo about that. You think about selling it, thank God. But anyway. But uh, do I ordain on no, I'm not into all that. But uh, you know, we, we get uh, we get caught up in all this stuff, you know. <laughs> but uh in, in in rituals and ways we do things and stuff. But you know, he said here, 
you, you, you've, uh, you've sown much, but you're just not getting the benefits of what I really want to give you. So you're in famine. Why are we in famine? There's a reason that the people of God were in famine. And, you know, we really want sometimes to need things to happen. He said, consider your ways. He said, now, basically, everybody's living, doing their own little world, doing their own little thing, for the purpose of God lies waste over here. And so, but Matthew, I was going to tell you about Matthew, got sidetracked with Sam Bo's liquor store. But Matthew just went to the national judging contest for the FFA. Some of you don't know what FFA is, Future Farmers of America. It's a big deal. In some countries, it's a little small places, it still is. But the Future Farmers of America. And he's got into cattle judging and livestock judging. And he just went to the national finals. And he got second in the nation in individual judging. He's already got a full scholarship to go to college, free ride through that. And his team, little team from Hermitage, Arkansas, won second in the nation in judging. And so uh, where I was born and raised up there. So uh, he said, man, Matthew has uh, got a place, what, his, what he really wants to do in this agricultural field, it pays $75,000 a year starting out. I said, well, Sambo, let me tell you, in today's prices, and by the time he graduates in four years, if he don't make $75,000 a year, he's going to be living struggling. And some of you that don't think you make anything, you might have to look up what you make. I said, he can live, but he won't live very high on the hog, so to speak. Because I'm going to tell you, you go to the grocery store now, you can walk out with a little bitty bag that'd be 200 and something dollars, you know. I mean, you, the prices today are just outrageous. Inflation has just, they, you know, they've deflated our dollar till it's not worth hardly anything, you know. I mean, you go and get, you just go get anything, and it's just astronomical what you're going to spend. And because uh, of today's prices, and like gasoline, diesel, tires, you know, anything, it's, it's just unbelievable the cost and how it's escalating. So I said, man, if you don't make sense, so Bailey, uh, this world is like a rat race, you know, we're in. And really, if you win the race, you know what that makes you? The number one rat. Think about it. You get to be pinned the number one. Maybe they'll put a rat tail on you or something. He's the number one rat. He beat all the other rats in life. So really... Getting into all involved, and we want to be blessed. We want to make a good living. We want to have nice things. We, I'm not against that, and God's not either. He will. We took years proving that God will bless those that bless His kingdom. But that we can't be satisfied when we just come to that place, because that's what Israel had done. They were satisfied with their blessings, but were, they were so satisfied they was willing to shut themselves up inside. Let me change the language a little bit. Inside their own little church kingdom and church house, while the world went to hell and enjoy the blessings of God, while the world was dying outside. <coughs> and because of that, God said. I'm not going to let you do that. I'm not going to let you enjoy my best and enjoy my finest. Because when you go and you're needing 50, you're only going to get 20. When you go and you're needing 30, you're only going to get 10. And when you go earn all that money and you put it in here, you're going to put it into bags that got holes in it. <coughs> I'm not going to let you live <coughs> totally blessed in that, with that kind of an attitude about my kingdom. Okay? <coughs> yeah, pardon my coughing. I've had some of that probably a little allergy or something. <coughs> well, it's bad when you got one of these mics. It makes it worse. <coughs> let you feel my pain my cough. Anyway. Now, let's look at this. He said, go up to the mountains, bring wood, build the house. God is telling them, 
start building my house. What is God's house? His church, His kingdom. What do we build it with? Soul. Give me a something here. Cough drop. I don't know about that thing. H. I only got a P in front of it. Okay. Y'all didn't get that one, did you? But anyway, uh, he said, bring wood, build the house. I'll try that for a while. Now, I'm not chewing tobacco. It's a cough drop. He said, I will take pleasure in it. He said, if you'd go to work on my house, I'd take pleasure in it. <laughs> and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. He said, because you look for much, and it came to little. <coughs> when you brought it home, I did blow it, blow upon it. Oh, now look what I got. God said, <coughs> what's creating all these problems? What's, what's causing me all this? I don't know about y'all, but I'm hot. But y'all, somebody give me a little air back here. That's what, what it is. I'm, I don't have any air circulating. I'm having trouble breathing with it. Just get the fan or something. But uh, there's something moving in here. He said, why, saith the Lord of hosts? And he said, because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man to his own house. He said, the reason I'm blowing on your blessing, the reason I'm blowing your blessing away, the reason I'm not giving you full blessing." reason you're only getting partial blessing is because my house is laying over here waste and you're running every man to his own house. You're doing all your work on your own house, but you're not ever working on my house. That's just the word of God. Now this is what God's saying to Israel. He said, therefore, because of that, the heavens over you is stayed from dew. The earth is stayed from her fruit. We're not getting what we want to see. I called for a drought. Whoa, who did? Who called for a drought? God called for a drought. He said, upon the land, upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, and upon the oil, upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, upon cattle, upon all the labor of your hands. Now, how many knows when you get into the covenant of Abraham, that's exactly the opposite. You got the curse and the blessing from the covenant of Abraham. And the blessing is, I'll bless you in the field. Now, this is the people that's in the covenant of Abraham, the promise of Abraham, which is the church. You've had enough teaching on that. You're the seed of Abraham. If you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed. You're heir according to the promise. I'll bless you in the field. I'll bless you when you go out. I'll bless you when you come in. I'll bless your crops. I'll bless your land. I'll bless your field. I'll bless your seeds. God's promises He will bless us. But at the same time, He was bringing famine. Why? Because the seed God gave us was in the barn. It hadn't been planted. And we were all working on our own little worlds, doing our own little thing. We were sidetracked from the purpose. Well, God's house lies waste. He wasn't doing anything to build the kingdom. And God said, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to let you get away with that. If that's the kind of attitude you're going to have, I'm going to blow on you when you bring it home. I'm going to cut holes in your bag when you put your money in. I'm going to bring drought on your blessings. That's why I ain't here today. I'm just preaching what the book says. Did he say it? How many say, say God was upset? Say God was upset with his covenant people. Because they were interested only and what their own selves could have instead of what they could do for God's house, God's kingdom. They were interested in storing up for themselves the things of God so God 
put them in a famine. And he said here, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Zacharyah, the high priest, with all the covenant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord. Because they did fear the Lord. Then spoke Haggai, the Lord's messenger, saying, saying uh, message to the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. See, when they had a repentant stage and began to change and said, we're going to go up and build God's house. We're, we're going to repent of this attitude. We're going to repent of what's going on. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and the spirit of the uh, Joshua, the son of Joshadek, and the spirit of the remnant of the people. And they came, verse 14, and did work in the house of the Lord of their host. All right. So they came and went to work on the house of God. And he said uh, in verse chapter 2, verse 3, Who is left among you that saw this in his first house? How do you see it now? And as if it was nothing, be strong, O Zerubbabel, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. My spirit remaineth among you. Then he here comes the prophecy. I'm going to shake the heaven and the earth, shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. I will fill this house with glory. How many know that's strictly talking about the church? And the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the glory of the former house. Verse 9. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. How many know that's exactly talking about the church? Because the glory of the grace is greater than the glory of law. The glory of Christ is greater than the glory of the Old Testament law. That's why Moses put that veil on it talked about. He had to wear a veil. The people, because when he came out of the presence of God, his face was shone like with glory. So Moses had to put a veil on his head. Why? Because it wasn't ordained for the people to see the glory until the curtains were rent in twain and the glory of Christ could be revealed to the nations of the world. And God, he wrote in the Corinthians, Paul did how that same blindness is still upon Israel's eyes today because they won't accept Christ and won't believe in Christ. And that darkness and that blindness is there. But church, we've been given the full glory. And if we want the blessings of God, the way God wants to really give them to us, we're going to have to quit being selfish. Have I ever been guilty? Absolutely. When I went to Colorado, we had a, we had a, <clears throat> some powerful things happening. We started with about, I can't remember how many in our first service. Was it nine or twelve people? That's babies and all. In our first service in Colorado. Fasted, prayed, taught Bible studies. I was right up there in the middle of some of the best hunting. I was raised a hunter, fisherman, done it all my life. I went pheasant hunting one time with a group of brethren. Never did go fishing. I only went pheasant hunting one time with a group of preachers. The whole three and a half years I was there, I never had time. Because I was in a small city, and I was there to build a church. But God gave me a dream while I was there. And I remember that dream vividly. It's affected my life. And in this dream, I saw, saw what would you picture what we would call heaven which I believe is the abode of the righteous or the acceptance place of God. And the Bible nowhere describes heaven. All those things we use, people call to describing heaven in the Bible is not heaven. That's the New Jerusalem, which is the church, or it's the church itself. It never describes what heaven really is in the Bible, nowhere. But I believe that when you die, you'll spend eternity with the Lord forever. I believe that's the hope of every Christian to make it very clear where I stand on that. Okay? with the hope of everybody because we're all going to die 
and after that the judgment. We got We got to go meet the Lord. We got to spend eternity with Him. I believe that's the hope of every Christian. That's throughout the Word of God. Where's it at? What's it going to be? I don't have the answers. I'm just trusting the Lord in that. But I'm going to spend eternity with Him if I live for Him, I serve Him. Okay. But anyway, I saw this door and I saw people coming up, and I saw this big angels were standing there. And they opened these this huge, they were huge doors. I mean, they were huge doors with big, big the handles, long, big handles on them, gold handles. And they were open those doors, and they would enter in to the joy of the Lord. And they would close the door. And uh, I remember I walked up there to that door in this dream. And the angel smiled, he opened the door. And then he stopped and said, hold it. You can't go in. And I forgot to tell you, this is what I saw. Everybody that came was dressed in solid white. They had solid white. And when they opened those doors, I did see inside. And inside was a marriage supper. Everybody in there had on solid white. There wasn't one, it was beautiful. And that, ta that table just went off into eternity as far as I could see. It was symbolic of the marriage supper of the Lamb which is actually being saved by Jesus Christ and living it, and, you know, being, being saved, brought into the kingdom. And, his marriage, and so he stopped and said, hold it, you can't go in. And I said, why not? And he said, you got the wrong garment on. And I looked down at that time and I had on a gray suit that I, uh, that I had to preach in. And the dream ended. And then the Lord showed me about Haggai and about how we could actually think we're so successful because we had the fastest growing church in the state that year, eventually, when God got through it. But what he was showing me is you can't just get saved and sit down on your laurels. You have got to work for the kingdom. You've got to have my kingdom in mind. And that's when we begin to work. And we begin to teach Bible studies. And we begin to, I begin to knock doors. And I begin to do everything I could. And then we had the fastest growing church in the state of our kind that year. And our church went from just a handful to almost a hundred. But that's, that's, that's not anybody. It's a lot in that city. Because so that church had been there for years and never done nothing. And that city was way smaller than this city. And God give us a lot of things begin to happen. We had we had all kinds of things begin to happen to us. We had miracles. We had healings take place. We had people get the Holy Ghost. I remember one night I was preaching to God, but always show me stuff. When I when I began to plant that seed, I started teaching Bible studies. Won a whole oil oil field crew. The whole crew. We have like four or five on the crew. We won the whole crew to the Lord. One boy got the Holy Ghost on the rig, come upstairs with his eyes rolled back and his head talking in tongues. And the main boss was out there and he said, what's wrong with him? He said, he must have got acid in his eyes. And, uh, and this, this Catholic boy that's on Facebook with me now uh, said, no, no. And you, ever, you don't feel deep, Elise. He was there on that rig. And uh, him and Lorraine, and uh, she wasn't on the rig, but he's married to Lorraine. I'm just talking about Facebook friends. If you're on Facebook, you might have seen some of them. But anyway, Phil said, no, 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 that's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Ghost. He said, what? The what? You know, a lot of crazy things begin to happen. It was all of a sudden, God was working with us. I'm going to tell you, it makes a difference when you're doing something that God is interested in. Because when you get busy with what God wants you to do, and you get busy with the purpose of God, you might not have all the money in the world, but God will work with you. Amen. <laughs> That's why I had a lot of financial miracles while I was there. I remember one day I didn't have nothing to eat, and <coughs> this center boy I'd been witnessing to stopped his car in the street, came up and knocked on my door, and handed me $100 or $200, came here and said, what is this? He said, I don't know. I was driving by your house, and God told me to stop and give you this. Woo! Hallelujah! <laughs> I'm telling you, when you go to work on God's house, <coughs> He will go working with you. Amen. He'll work with you. 
Man, when you go to work on God's house, you see, you can't just sit around and talk about what you don't have. You've got to use what you do have. But Brother Smith, I'm, I'm going to tell you. Let me tell you a little secret here. The power is in the seed. Did you know that 90% of new converts are brought in by a new convert? Now why is that? This new convert don't know all about the Bible. They just know God done something for me, man. I got a Holy Ghost. I mean, I got, man, this is what I'm having in my life. Man, you got to come. Man, that guy's life changed. I'm coming out to see what happened to him. I mean, come on now. You're excited about what God's got. But see, after you've had it a while and you get mature and you get late, I'm mean, going to say that. You get a. Uh, <laughs> satisfied and not so excited no more of this old hat. You're mature now. Hallelujah. You know, some young convert, praise God! Hallelujah. When you get excited about what God's doing. Because the power's in the seed. Let me tell you something. When you plant, when you plant radishes, I love radishes. When I go to Uptown Grill, they, they got where you put radishes. Man, I, I love to get their salad because I eat them radishes. I'm like an old rabbit when it comes to them radishes. I love radishes. I was raised on radishes. I was a country boy. Onions and green onions, man, radishes. Woo! Now my wife won't let me eat onions. I'm just kidding. Amen. And so, I, I tell you though, how to get, I, I figured out one day how to get onions off your breath. You want me to tell you all the secret? Eat garlic. <laughs> but anyway, they won't smell the onion at all. But anyway, you know, I, 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 I've never, we used to plant them radishes. My dad would have us plant those radishes. You know what? I didn't do anything. I just planted it. And you go out there one day and there's a, there's a radish sticking its head up. I didn't do anything. The power was in the seed. You know, when I was in Christ, I tell the guy come to church, why he said, you know, oh, oh, Faye Jones witnessed to me. I said, Faye Jones, he's a drunk. He was a, he was the church drunk. Now, he wasn't in church, but his wife was. And old Faye was a drunk. He just he stayed drunk all the time, but he believed the message. So he, he, took, a, he took a seed that was good. Come on, come on now. And he dropped it on a seed, on a heart that needed to know the truth. And they come to church and got saved and got changed and old face stayed a drunk. He got saved by a seed, a drunk dropped. While we who are holy and righteous sit in the house of God with our self-righteous and won't even tell anybody about God. Now I'm a little bit old fashioned today. But I'm telling you what the book says. Power's in the sea. I begin to teach Bible studies. Man, people begin to believe the Word of God. God helped me. God was helping me through that stuff. You see, He helps you. You see, when you start planting the seed and working on God's house, God starts working with you at that moment. And all of a sudden, what you didn't have much of, you see, that's when I, you hear me tell the story that I walked into this house, this place, and, uh, and there was this girl, and she was growling like a mad dog and had slobber running out, and they, they, everybody had run out of the apartment complex. And I drove into the apartment complex, told my wife, this place is full of devils. I said, man, I can feel the demons in this house. Why, how do you know that? Because I was planting seed, and God was working with me. That's how I know that. And that's why I was able to walk up there and walk up in her face and her growling me like a mad dog and tell, claiming she's going, she hated me. And I walked right up in her face and said, I don't like you either, devil. And that's when he changed it. Oh, whoa, come out. I said, yeah, you're coming out. And she did, he did come out. And his six buddies with him. And you know what? And she's in church today. She's on my Facebook with me because she's still living for God. She's still in the church today. Why? Because God was working with me. How do you have power to do that? I don't have power. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That's the reason I could look that homosexual in the face that was, eyes looked like orange fire and he was talking in tongues of the devil. 
and tell me, I want to choke you. Why do I want to kill you? I said, probably the devil. And when he went up to choke me, I just said, in Jesus' name. And, and the something rose up out of me and grabbed him and set him in his chair. He, God wouldn't even let him get out of his chair. Why? Because he said, then I'll begin to work with you. When you dare to get out and plant seed, when you dare to get out and preach truth, when you dare to get out and share what I got, then I'll start working with you. And when you need me, you won't get 50. When you need to set that devil in his chair, you'll get a hundredfold devil set in his chair. I'm not going to just set him halfway in his chair. I'm going to put him all the way in his chair. And that's why one day I needed $2,000 to pay taxes with. Or no, it was seven, I believe it was like $1,700. And I went to the church that day. That little old church didn't have a dime to my name. And it was due that weekend. And while I was praying, a man come in the back door and walked out of that aisle and laid some money on the table and walked out the back door. When I got up, it was $1,700. Why? Because when you're going to work on God's house, God will work with you. He said, I know what you need. I'm going to end the famine. Whatever you need, I'm going to give you 100%. I'm not going to give you 10%. I'm not going to give you $500. I'm not going to give you $1,000. I'm going to give you $1,700 because that's what you need. I will supply all you need according to your, my riches and glory. Why, when I looked at that evangelist's face when we had that revival, Brother Eddie Jones had wrote all them tracks. And I said, he said, how you going? You going to General Conference? I said, yeah, I'm going. He said, I, he said, well, we would had like five get the Holy Ghost or something. Three, uh, five got baptized, three got the Holy Ghost. He said, how you going? I said, by faith, man. He said, church giving you some money? I said, no. He said, how much you need? A thousand dollars, man. He said, Brother Smith, this is Sunday night. We're leaving Monday morning. He said, you ain't got no money to go to conference? No. And you saying you need $1,000 to go to conference? Yeah. He said, how are you going to conference? I said, by faith. When I went to go into 7-Eleven, one of those five that got baptized in Jesus' name for the first time, he a little short Mexican guy. He come walling out the door like this. Brother Smith, what? God told me to give you something. Do really what you want to. Yeah. He shoved some cash. Go get it, Jones. Look at him. What is that? I said, I don't know, brother. I just got through telling him I got him a thousand dollars. It was one hundred dollar bills. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Once you prosper, I will work with you. You get to what you do. I planted a seed in his life, and I had a need, and God met my need because I planted his seed. It wasn't because I was super holy, it wasn't because I was super righteous, it's because I was willing to plant a seed. Wanted to build God's house. That's why the night I was in prayer and we had this visitor walk in. I'm gonna tell you the whole mission. You, 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 you think it's a small crowd, you know. We ain't got a hundred here, I don't think, in the adult class anyway. And uh, you know, but your whole missions, you're talking, you know, <laughs> seven, eight, ten, fifteen people. And this visitor came in and She'd been coming a couple of times, and I walked back there one night after church was dismissed, and I said, you know, God showed me something about you. She said, did he really? I said, yeah, he sure did. Well, what did he show you? He showed me you fixed to get the Holy Ghost. She started bawling. I laid my hand on her head. No music. Church is dismissed. She started speaking in tongues right there. Praise God. Instantly. You got some kind of power? No. I had a seed I planted in her heart. And now God's given increase. Hallelujah. 
God filled her with the Holy Ghost. She was a key element to others getting the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah to God. I'm going to tell you, just keep planting seed, friend. You just keep planting seed. Because the more seeds you plant, some of it's going to fall on good ground. Some of it's going to fall on, on ground that's going to be hungry for the Lord. They're not all going to be hungry. Some's going to be really, you know, what the, you know, you know, it was amazing after I had that parable, that, that vision, that dream and all that, and God began to deal with me about planting all his seed for his kingdom. And, uh, you know, they got these, these, all, all these parables. And God said, you know, he said uh, one day in prayer, God said, you know, my servants are supposed to go out and give the invitation. He said, and it's the, it's the world that's supposed to give the excuses. How about land? Which is materialism. I'm too involved in materialism to go to church. I've got a wife, my personal family. I'm just too busy with family relationships and associations and raising a family to have time for God. Oxen, my job. I'm just too, too much work to work too many hours. I ain't got time for God. He said, now my servants are too busy to go and give to him. We're all dwelling in our sealed houses. Living in our own little worlds. Doing our own little thing. While his house lies waste. I never worry about what this going to think. I just put the word of God in. God always worked it out. God helped me with every word I spoke. He helped me with everything I did. I remember one situation I went into. I forgot what he, this boy said. If he says one thing about so and so, said I'm out of here. He had a. He, he looked like he, he, he was a Mexican boy. He looked like he thought he had double handlebar mustache. He had his handlebar mustache. He looked kind of like Yosem Yosemite Sam. And he. Looked like he already had them, you know, them six shooters around him where he had two of them. But he didn't have any. He, but he could tell his spirit. They invited me up to eat because I'd witnessed to some of the family. How many of you had some of the family interested and some of the family not interested? Yeah. I know what he said. He said, if he says one thing about God, I'm leaving. That was his word. Now his wife was the secretary of a local church in that city that didn't understand full revelation of apostolic things. But anyway, she, you know, but she was wanting me to come. And uh, so I remember he wouldn't have much to do at all with me. You know, he was kind of cool. So uh, he was over cutting ham. But you know, that kind of reminded me of a joke I heard one time. I said, one time I was a, a, a I believe it was a pig and a chicken. And they were going to a picnic. And uh, I said, uh, I, I, no, I believe it was a duck and a chicken was going to a picnic. That's what it was. And said they, they met a pig. And pig said, let me go. I said, well, that's a good idea. I said, you know, I can furnish the eggs and you can furnish the ham. That pig said, now, wait a minute. With you, that's just a sacrifice. With me, that's total commitment. You know, just a little silly joke. I saw him go. Saw his shoulder shake a little bit. You think I'm interested in that joke? No, I'm interested in breaking his spirit. This is just as important. What I'm doing right here in this situation, because a soul is hanging in the balances, is just as important to be led of God right here is anything you're going to do in your life. That's why when I teach a two-day Bible study to a new person for the first time, when I'm finished, I'm totally exhausted because I am sensitive to their every need while I'm doing it. I want the Holy Ghost feelers to be there that I make every word just right. I take this just as far as they can stand it, but I stop not where I've got to stop. Because I don't know them, but God knows them. I 
and so anyway I, I forgot the other joke I told I told another joke or two had him kind of laughing breaking down a little bit so I didn't say a word about God I didn't know he'd said that but for some reason I never said anything about God so we got sit down to eat and that was an awesome meal you know awesome meal so it's about must have been 10 15 of us we sat down to eat at this big old table and he asked a question he said uh how do you like Fort Morgan? That was the name of the city I was in. Now, he can't get mad at me because I'm just answering his question. Okay? He asked me a question. I've got to answer it, right? I said, oh, we like it just fine, I guess. I said, of course, you know, if you, if you go to any city, you feel like God has sent you there. And I started in. Another question was asked. Another question. Two hours later, I realized I hadn't eaten. I didn't eat a bite. Too busy answering questions. Can't be mad because they're asking, they're asking me. I'm just answering. I didn't bring up God. He brought it up. He said, how you like Colorado? You know, Not my fault that God sent me there. You see, you're afraid to bring God in. Afraid your friends would be upset. If I hadn't mentioned God, they'd still be lost. But he kept asking me questions. Well, what about this? I said, well, that's in a Bible study I'd like to teach you. I'll tell you what y'all really need. Y'all really need a two-day Bible study. I don't care what you got. I got you need a two-day Bible study. When Robert did you come to me years ago with a divorce situation, I said, what you really need, Robert, is a two-day Bible study. And he got in church because he was getting a divorce and needed a two-day Bible study. Then I gave him a book on marriage. He'd come down and throw it on my desk two days later and said, My God, no wonder she left. I run her off. I broke everything in that book. I didn't do none of it right. Let me know that's Robert. And the only one would have been early this morning to come on time would have been Robert. He would have been on time for the first day. First time in his life this morning. He come he come to church on time twice as when he forgot the time was changed. And he made it on time. But, you know, they just, and finally, finally, he got so aggravated, he said, I'd answer it with, well, see, I knew if I answered that, he'd be offended. So I said, really, this, this Bible study? Well, I want the Bible study. I want the Bible study. I said, okay, okay, I, I, I'll come teach you the Bible study. We got the Bible study set up and won every one of them people to the Lord. Every one of them. Baptized all their families in Jesus' name. They all got the Holy Ghost. This boy still supports this ministry today. You get a check from him every month to write it by the word. He still, to this day, supports our ministry. Why? Somebody dropped a seat. Somebody took time to go to somebody's house, have a supper, and we had a real supper that night. We shared the Word of God. What to do? I planted seed all night long in the hearts of about five families. And all those families come down seed. Awesome? I think so. Are you some professional? No. The power was in the seed. The power was in the truth. But the Lord worked with me so powerfully that I seen miracles. That's why when we had a boy who was hit by a freight train and his grandpa come to church and you could look at his pelvic bone and you, I can't read x-rays, but his pelvic bone was set apart. Like here was his pelvic bone is sitting like this and there's a crack in the middle. You could see it in about four places. His pelvic bone was shattered and crushed when they hit a freight train. But only to hear that grandpa, after we prayed, come back with another x-ray and another testimony that God had healed his grandson and he's already walking in. Why? Because if you plant the seed, God will begin to work with you. It's not your wholeness, it's his. But you've got to have time to get out of your sealed house.
I've never pastored in a city that we didn't have a campaign and we knocked every door in the city. Never won the whole city, but some of them. When I fed my first church I pastored, I wore out literally a pair of shoes, knocking doors. A city of 8,000, me and another couple in that church would go out, us two couples, if we would knock every door in that city of 8,000 people. What's God going to do? He's going to bless it. I remember one time we ran out of tracks and, and invitations to revival. We met here. There was one house left. We didn't get to that house. One person came to that revival. When he told me where he lived, guess what house he was in? He was in the one that we didn't give a track to. But somebody else give him a track. Why? We were out planting seed. And when you do that, God, He'll do things that you know you didn't do. He's showing you His awesome power. He's showing you His awesome anointing. You won't be going and getting needing 50 and getting 30. You won't be. I'm gonna tell you, you got people on the job that you really, they really need to know the truth. See if God will help you tell them about the greatness of God. You know, we, we, we sit around and say, we make fun about kingdom, about Pentecost and all that. You know, we don't need to do that because we could be shutting somebody out. We better be sensitive to what God wants. We need to be thinking the whole time. When we're out in public, we need to be thinking, how can I touch these people for the Lord? You know, Brother Greg, that we've been praying for, but you know, been a, been a member here for years. You know where we first met him? We first met him on a golf course. We dropped a seed. Dropped a seed. Amen. No matter where you're at. Top course. Job. Best run. Wherever. God may be. I always looked at it like this. God. Let me, let me do it in another way. I, I'm closing. Other day I was at Whataburger. Full of Catholic people here. There was a, I don't know if you've ever seen, there was a red-headed guy with red hair. First he had long hair, then somebody cut his hair off. Kind of a bum like guy was around town here for, for about a week or two. Walked in the streets of El Campo with a satchel on his back. He came in Whataburger sitting on the end. I looked over there and I said, have you eaten today? Do you have anything to eat? He said, no, I haven't. I said, would you like something to eat? He said, I sure would. I said, here. All I have is a 20. I said, well, here. You'll have to eat later. Just take the whole 20. Get you something to eat. Get you something later on. He said, thank you so much. He went and got him something to eat. She said, me, you can't feed the whole world. Now, I, I don't have to. i got to help those that God says before me. And that Catholic guy looked at me and he said, man, I can't believe that. He said, I mean, he's one of these committed guys. He said, what is it? Ain't a Catholic in this town would have done what you just done. He said, man, Peter, he said, none of these guys. You see, I may not have been supposed to bless him as much as I was supposed to touch this guy. And let me see what true Christianity really is. And sometimes when they see it coming out of your pocketbook, it means more to tight people. Hello. That's what I'm saying. When you pull a 20 out, I could have given him two dollars. I pulled a twenty out and give it to him because that's who God had set before me. This make any sense to you? You see, but it could not be monetary things, and it could not be physical things. 
it could be spiritual things. I remember the old bum one night to come here, sit on the back. That's back when we were Pentecost going full swing. This thing was really rocking and rolling. And he said, God, give me a sign. If this is of you, <laughs> give me a sign. By the time lightning said, boom, shook this whole place. And every light in it went dead flat. <coughs> I dude went out that door so fast. I mean, buddy, he didn't let nothing. I mean, you think you want a sign. I mean, it was lightning hit somewhere really close, and I don't know where it was at, but it shook this whole building. It, it, every light in here was solid. Man, I'm going to tell you, without windows, it can get dark in here. Let me tell you again. Imagine when it's cloudy out That dude was out that door. Well, you know, we had to go out too because you couldn't see in here no more. So we walked out there. He was sitting on the side of the building trying to light a cigarette. He said, My God. <laughs> He said, I ain't never been so scared in my life. I said, what happened? He said, man, I told God, if I thought it was real, give me, a, give, give, give me a sign. He said, my Lord. He said, did he give me a sign? <laughs> we baptized that old boy in Jesus' name. <laughs> what happened to him? I don't know, last time I seen him, he was still bumming. I believe him, I even got the Holy Ghost. I can't remember. It's been a long time ago. He come back through here. He come back through another time. See, so you meet these questions. He come back through another time in on. He somehow this bum had acquired a uh, somebody to give him or something. I don't know. He had a motor home. That's some old motor home was about to give him. And that thing caught on fire here in El Campo, burning up. You know. That's like old Robert. Old Robert one day he had somebody gave him a van. He used to park it right on the corner. I said, my God, Robert, don't park that thing on the corner of our church. Park it over behind this building over here where nobody would see that thing. I said, that is the ugliest thing I have ever seen in my life. Y'all remember that van? Oh, Brother Rick, you all remember that van. That was the ugliest thing. Somebody gave it to Brother Robert. I know they just wanted to get out of their yard. Robert, he, you know, for air conditioning went out, he just screwed him a fan into the tires of the battery, screwed a fan on the dash. That was his air conditioner. He had one of them about five years. What about there? You know, God, if you're doing His work, will work with you. Do you need a blessing? you need the help of God? you need to do the will of God? you need blessings in your life? you want the full thing of God? You go to work on God's house. He said, because when you do, He said, you go to work on my house? He said, I'm going to start working with you. Come back, everybody who's playing this thing up here. We got somebody playing I done run some of them off, I guess. Sister Jackie hung with me. Good, Sister Jackie. Praise God. Did you have anybody sister, to be baptized or did you? You got more? Okay, we got. You want to do that like after church or you want to just whatever? We got a lady come to be baptized today. All right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Why don't you just uh, take her back here and uh, got, the, got the stuff back here getting ready and uh, praise the Lord. She asked us if we'll be baptized. Sister Price, good to have you here today. Amen. Your sister. Whoa, hallelujah. That's great, isn't it? All right. Show them where the gowns are. I think it's wonderful when we baptize people. I don't tell me you've been dropping seed. Come on now. He knows God don't forget a promise he met for 30 years.
Father. and takes things out I want you to replace it replace it with the power and an anointing of God the Lord that can do all things supernaturally supernatural delivers God in Jesus name teach him relationship Father teach him an anointing of God teach him Father in Jesus name the Lord put a desire in his heart right now that would supersede all of the desires that would supersede all of the cravings, God, any fleshly cravings. I bind all fleshly cravings right now in the name of Jesus, that's not of God. I bind it from his life in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, and I want you to put desire in his spirit right now. Put desire in his spirit right now. Put desire for the things of God in his spirit, Lord, that he cannot get away from. I want you Lord, I want you to put a hook in his jaw and pull him, Father. Pull him to you, God. Lord, he's never going to forget what he saw here as a child. And that's where he's here right now. He can't forget what, Lord, he saw happen in this church house as a little boy. That's pulling on his spirit, God. And I want you to pull now, Lord. Pull him all the way in, God. I want you to give him power now. Anoint him and give him strength over fleshly desires. And let them be replaced with godly desires. Father, I curse all fleshly desires in Jesus' name right now. And we want the Spirit of God to lead him right now. To guide him right now. To overshadow him right now. I want a hunger for God to displace everything else in his life right now. I want it to pull him and to push him. God, in Jesus' name. I want a craving for God, a hunger for God. To enter his spirit, Lord, that he won't be able to turn him loose, God, until he has the fullness of God in his life. Touch him, Father, right now. Anoint him, God, right now. Give him strength, God, right now. Hallelujah. Anoint him, Father. Jesus name. Let an anointing be there. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Something's been telling you, son, that the, the battle's too hard. The feet. That's been whispering in your spirit that you're too far gone, that you, it's just too much struggle. You're too sucked in by things. And that's what you know that that's not true. You're not a wasted seed. The battle is not too hard for you because God will help you through it. Matter of fact, if you just turn it over to the Lord, He said the battle is not yours, but it's the Lord's. And let Him fight that battle for you. Jesus name. Lord, in Jesus name, strengthen my brother as never before. Give him a faith he's never had before. Let him see that greater is he that's in us. It's greater than he that's in the world. Father, in Jesus name, let him walk on faith right now. And let that hunger pull him into the fullness of the things of God. Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father, right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're going to learn to say a new word. When things of the world pulls on you, you're going to learn to say no. And you're going to learn to say another word when the things of God pulls on you, you're going to learn to say yes, Lord. Here I am. Here I am, Father. Whatever you want, I release myself to your hands. Fill me with your fullness. 
said from this day I will bless you. You can make a commitment right here, right now in this church house, before God and man, that from this day forward your life will be different. From this day forward, he said I will bless you. Jesus name. Jesus name. Jesus name. Jesus name. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I believe it's going to be better. All right. Praise God. I remember him from a little bitty character. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How we doing? Got one ready to baptize. All right. Somebody got that camera? Get it on a lady getting baptized. If you haven't got it on. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And they're gone in the name of Jesus. Baptized into Christ. Let's stand and worship Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's beautiful. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, yes, Lord. That's right, Lord. one thing to hear a message. It's another thing to do something about it. If somebody don't do something with what I preached this morning, I've wasted my time. It's just a good message. But God wants us to take this word from this house today and have a soul, I must say soul consciousness soul consciousness when we go out into this world. We need to be looking for somebody to drop a seed. Be excited about church. Be excited about coming to the house of God. Be excited about Jesus. Amen? And tell somebody about the Lord. Amen? If you will, God will work with you. He'll take the famine out of your life and He'll work with you as never before. And when you need 50, you won't get 20. You'll get 50. You might even get 75. Amen. Hallelujah. He might just pour in. He said, he said if you'll, he'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, you won't be able to receive. Press down. Shaking together. Doing what? Running over. Ooh, I like that running over stuff, don't you? 
I like that running over blessing. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what happened to her. Her blessing was running over the baptistry. Sometimes you get so much God, it just kind of runs over. Let's thank the Lord. Bring somebody to the house of God. Witness to somebody this week. Hello. Witness to somebody this week about the things of God. Don't lose what God said. You want him to work with you? Be a witness for him. You're a witness unto me, saith the Lord. Let's lift our hands to him. Father, we're so thankful today for your spirit, your blessings, your word. God, help us now, Lord, to be anointed to go forth to bring somebody into the kingdom, to drop the seed of God in somebody's heart, even this week, Lord, to find somebody, a hungry heart, that we can witness to and tell about the things of God. Not keep it inside of us, not keep it in our sealed houses, Pour, oh God, and let this seed lie waste. But Lord, let us pour this seed out. Let's pour it in the hearts of others that you can come forth and bring the blessings of God 100-fold in our life. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Greet one another. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right.